The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Aliens from the deep, snake-like, but even more fascinating. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. This week, we're looking at creatures that make many people look away. Tonight, in our series on vilified beasts, the eel. They're not exactly fish, and they're certainly not snakes that live in water. What they are, if you can get over the slithery, darting weirdness of eels, is fascinating. Truly ever-changing, versatile, and resilient. With us to win you over to the remarkable characteristics of eels, in Malmö, Sweden, Patrick Svensson, journalist and author of the Book of Eels, our enduring fascination with the most mysterious creature in the natural world. And in our nation's capital, Stephen Cook, professor and Canada Research Chair of Environmental Science and Biology at Carleton University. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to start with the most basic of questions. And Stephen, I'd like to start with you. What is an eel? So an eel actually is a fish. Uh, there's actually 800 or so species of eel in the world. So they're not, it's not like there's just one of them. There's, there's many of them around the world. Uh, the eel that we have right here in Ontario is called the American eel. Uh, it exists all the way, for, its range is from Venezuela all the way up uh, to the uh, Eastern Arctic. It's in fact this fish species with the greatest geographic range that includes uh, Canada within it within that home range. Uh, they're incredible beasts. They're long and skinny. They do look like a snake. Uh, they're quite slippery, but they do have scales. They've got tiny little scales. They're covered in a fair amount of mucus, but essentially they are elongate. They they are they they do look very much like a snake when they're swimming in the water. All I heard was mucus. <laughs> But you know, for to uh, for to us, they look like snakes. So what makes them fish? Right. Uh, so they have gills and they obtain their oxygen from the water. Uh, they are entirely different from from reptiles uh, in that way. Uh, and uh, what's remarkable uh, about them is their life cycle. It's really unique. There's not many beasts that are like them. We're going to talk about the life cycle in just a, a moment. But in, in Ontario here, what makes an eel different from a lamprey? Right. So in the Great Lakes, people might be familiar with lamprey. Uh, lamprey are a parasite. They're sort of like a vampire fish uh, that jumps on board, say, a, a native lake trout and essentially derives its nourishment from eating that animal from blood and other tissues that it eats from that animal. So it's parasitic. And in fact, we spend uh, many millions of dollars of uh, a year uh, trying to eradicate or control the population of, in, of invasive sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. On the other hand, eel are actually endangered. Eel are in an entirely different family, different group of, of fish, and in fact, they are imperiled. And so we are actually uh, going to great lengths to try and restore those populations. We'll talk about some of the conservation efforts that are being made. Uh, a moment ago, you mentioned the life cycle of an eel. We're going to have a graphic up here on the screen. <clears throat> Can you explain to us what the eel life cycle is? Right, so the eel are catadromous, which is a fancy scientific word for meaning that uh, they spawn in the ocean in salt water. Uh, so that's where the males and females come together uh, and then uh, the eggs are fertilized. Uh, then there ends up with a leptocephali stage, which you can see at the, the top of that image, uh, which is a larval stage, which uh, moves about in the Gulf Stream for uh, uh, a number of weeks. Uh, and then uh, there's a metamorphosis that occurs and they become glass eels. They spend uh, upwards of a year in that phase and then move on to uh, the next phase, which are elvers, at which point they're starting to move, actively move upstream into fresh waters. When they're fully in fresh water, then they become yellow eels. And that's the part where they spend the majority 
majority of their life. So they might spend uh, 10 or 15 years as, uh, as yellow eels. That's where they're growing. That's where they would be in places like Lake Ontario. And then when they mature, they become silver again and head back to sea. They're kind of the opposite of Pacific salmon. Everybody thinks about how salmon are born in freshwater, go to the sea and come back. These animals are opposite where they're born in the sea, come to freshwater to grow, and then go back to the sea to reproduce. Uh, they're also similar to Pacific salmon in that they die after they spawn. So they really only got one mm -hmm. shot at reproduction. And Patrick, you've written this incredible book that's resonated with a lot of people. It's part memoir and natural history. How did you become interested in eels? Well, first of all, it's a remarkable animal, I think. And the life cycle that Steve just explained is, is just a great story, you know. My, but my fascination for eels started already when I was a child and I was... Uh, went fishing for eels with my father. That's what we did together, me and my father. Uh, late summer nights down by a small stream and it was just me and him. And he was he told me about the eel. He told me about this incredible journey to the Sargasso Sea and uh, all these strange details that surround the eels. So I, I have had this fascination for this fish since I was a small child. Are you surprised by how it's resonated with people? Because when you do think about eels, I don't know if you think about a best-selling book or an award-winning book. No, it, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit su surprised, uh, I have to say, because also a lot of people have this image of eels that they are uh, uh, scary and, and disgusting, you know, they are snake-like and slimy. And, so, so I, I, I've, been, I've been surprised about, I met a lot of people who read the book who said that I had no idea I would ever read a book about this subject and, and actually enjoy it. But that's the best thing you can accomplish, I think. And in your book, too, you reveal that uh, there's a lot of historical figures who were also fascinated, maybe obsessed with the eels, uh, Aristotle, uh, Sigmund Freud. Why do you think that these men were so fascinated with eels? Yes, I, I was actually also surprised about the, the time and effort that people have put down to understand the eel for several hundred of years, from uh, Aristotle to Rachel Carson. And, and uh, there's been in natural science, they, they have talked about the eel question as a specific question that's been very, very hard to solve, and to, to answer, to understand what the eel is and how they breed and uh, where they breed. All these uh, uh, questions that have been surrounding the eel. And I think that's, uh, the, that's also what makes the eel fascinating for, for me and also for all these scientists, that they are mysterious, that they are very hard to, to understand and to explain. Why is it important for us to understand how they live and how they function? Why is this important? I think uh, I think that's that's actually the wrong question. I think it, what what the scientific history of the eel tells us is that the, there's a there's a human force to understand the world and to understand nature and understand life around us. And there's no there's no. Uh, gaining by understand uh, how the eels uh, reproduce but there's a human force that wants to know and this this force I'm, is uh, very strong and I think it's a very interesting story also about uh, uh, human uh, about science and about how science works and how we know the things we know we know Freud now for another reason, uh, but back in the day, he spent time dissecting hundreds of eels. Um, what was he trying to figure out? Well, this was in 1876, and uh, Freud was, uh, he was 19 years old, and uh, this was his first scientific um, work. He, uh, and he was trying to prove that the eels have sexual differences, because they didn't they hadn't been able to prove that at that point. So specifically, he was trying to find a male eel with sex sexual organs. He was trying to find an eel testicle. And he went to Tr uh, Trieste in what's now uh, Italy. 
and he dissected over over 400 eels trying to find this magical eel testicle and he failed he he wasn't able to find one and and uh, I, I maybe that has something to do with uh, his later career you know with um, going into the, the human mind instead of trying to understand the eel and uh, all this theory about uh, penis envy and the uh, castration complex. When you wrote this book, um, part of it was, you said that you started becoming fascinated with eels because it's something that you did with your father. When you finished the research and you wrote the book, is there anything that you didn't know before you started researching that you discovered along the way that surprised you? There's a lot of things I didn't know about the scientific history and about all the, those great uh, scientists who have tried to um, understand the eel. And I was actually surprised about how big part the eel question has played in the scientific uh, history and the number of scientists who have really uh, uh, tried, to, tried to answer this question. And part of this eel question, Stephen, is uh, figuring out where eels live. Where do they live? Right. So they, they obviously are spread between the ocean and fresh water, uh, but there are many mysteries that remain. Uh, so let's take uh, uh, something like a yellow eel, so an adult eel that's getting near the point where it's going to reproduce, and let's pretend it's been hanging around Hamilton Harbor, so uh, in the uh, west end of Lake Ontario. That animal has to undertake a 5,500 kilometer journey through Lake Ontario, downstream uh, in the St. Lawrence, and out to the Sargasso Sea. Now, we keep throwing around this, you know, this, this term, the Sargasso Sea. Where is that? It's essentially the Bermuda Triangle. And it really, when these fish head there, that's what it's like. They disappear. Nobody has ever seen uh, an American eel reproduce in the wild. We actually don't know what that looks like. We, we just know generally it's in a big swath of of the ocean between Bermuda and the Bahamas, but beyond that, there's many unknown. Uh, in fresh water, when they're adults, um, they're active mostly at night. Uh, they're nocturnal animals when they'll move around and they'll feed on invertebrates and small fish and frogs and such. Uh, but during the day, they burrow in the mud. So their habitat includes soft bottom, sand, some gravel. Uh, and in the winter, in fact, they spend much of their time uh, um, uh, buried. In fact, some folks have estimated that over the course of the life of an eel, they spend three quarters of their life buried in substrate. Uh, so uh, in, in many cases, yes, they're in the water column, but their habitat is also uh, um, in the substrate, in the bottom of rivers and, and lakes. So what's the difference between an eel that can be found in the Great Lakes and, say, one that can be found in Europe? Right. So they all, uh, to our knowledge, reproduce uh, in and around the Sargasso Sea. So uh, that part's not entirely different. Uh, but when, they, uh, when they're um, heading to different parts of the world uh, as uh, juveniles, some head towards uh, North America and the, and the uh, European eels head towards uh, Europe. Uh, uh, the European eels tend to uh, li uh, live a little bit longer, but otherwise there's not really a whole lot of difference. They're pretty similar, uh, pretty similar beasts, uh, and they certainly taste quite similar. And how do you, how do they know where to go? Can you tell us more about the migration of eels? Right. So uh, certainly there's some level of uh, um, magnetic sensory capability. Uh, they certainly pay attention to light as well. So people, uh, scientists do experiments where they cover the eyes, uh, where they glue magnets on the, the, the forehead of these animals and, and such. Uh, and it seems that they use a variety of cues. There's not one single cue they use to navigate uh, during their journey. Is it true that eels can walk on land? Well, not walk, but they certainly can move on, on land uh, for short periods of time. Uh, so there are dams that are in the way sometimes for migrations. And sometimes if it's, uh, and remember these animals are active at night, and if it's a, a wet night and there's some grass and dew or rain, uh, these animals will emerge from the water and actually make their way on land around these barriers in an attempt to get upstream. It's pretty uncommon. You're not going to go for a walk at your 
your local park on a you know in the evening and see a bunch of eels uh, up on the up on the lawn. But uh, it is a phenomenon that has been documented. Wouldn't that be a sight to see? <laughs> And uh, Patrick, in your book, you write about Johannes Schmidt. What, who was he and what role did he play in our understanding of the eel? Exactly. He, uh, I'm, I'm interested in telling stories and the, the, the scientific history of the eel is full of great story. If you don't just ask, what do we know about the eel, but also ask, how do we know it? Uh, uh, for example, uh, how do we know that the eel breeds in uh, the Sargasso Sea? We know that because there was a Danish uh, biologist called uh, Johannes Schmidt, who went out to, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean and tried to find the, the birthplace of the eel. And his method was to find those small larvae, the Leptocephalus uh, larvae, uh, uh, and, and the, the theory was that w the place where they were at the smallest size that's the place where the, the eel is born. So he spent, he spent almost 20 years. He spent 18 years on the Atlantic, sailing around, catching small larvas, measuring them. And after 18 years, he found a place where there was just tiny, tiny larvas that uh, obviously has been uh, newly hatched. And he could say that this is the birthplace of the eel. But as, as uh, Stephen said, no, no one has ever seen eels breed. They won't do it in captivity, and no one has even seen an uh, uh, eel in the Sargasso Sea, live or dead. Only these small, newly hatched uh, larvae. Why is that? That is, that is part of the mystery. People have certainly tried. They have uh, tried to put uh, transmitters on eels uh, going to the Sargasso Sea, and they have tried to catch the eels uh, there. But but it's 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 almost like the eel is is hiding from us in in a sense uh, and that's also what makes makes it uh, fascinating and i'm thinking too if you know for uh, we have farmed fish now and if you don't know how um eels mate i guess you can't farm them is that right Stephen? Yeah, and so there are farmed eels, but the way it works is that uh, people go out and they capture the glass eels. They bring them into captivity or put them in sea cages and, and uh, or, uh, cages in freshwater and raise them there. So there still is an impact with the culture side of things. It requires taking the uh, the small fish. From, that are caught in the wild, bringing them into captivity and just growing them. Uh, when one does that, then that allows you to harvest that protein and you can, you know, there's less mortality and so on. Uh, there are researchers in Japan working on a Japanese eel species and they've had some success with trying to get these animals to reproduce uh, um, in, the, uh, in captivity and trying to figure out uh, those early phases of the life cycle, in particular that, that leptocephali stage and how to maintain that in in the laboratory, but there's still so much to learn. And are you, because for me, just learning about eels, I'm surprised that um, they don't know how they mate. And I'm, I'm assuming that scientists have tried many ways to discover that information. Are you surprised that we still don't know that, Stephen? Uh, <laughs> Yes and no, but the ocean is a big place. Mm -hmm. And some of the telemetry data that uh, Patrick referenced before, uh, some of the, the satellite tags tell us that these animals are uh, in the day at 500 plus meters of depth, at night, they come up to relatively shallow water, 200 meters. That's still really, really deep mm -hmm. and beyond the kind of, you know, you're not going to be out there snorkeling or scuba diving and encounter those, uh, those animals. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Sargasso Sea, it's really difficult to put your place, your finger on a place. There's no specific physical habitat. It's, it's an area. Uh, and yes, there's Sargassum, which uh, is a, a kind of algae, which is in that region. Uh, uh, but but that's it. There's it's not like you know in freshwater where we can point at the pile of rocks and say that's where the animals reproduce and we can go and just stare at that until they come. Uh, it doesn't happen in that that open ocean in the same way. And Patrick, having having written a book that's resonated with people, and when we talk about the conservation efforts uh, of eels, do you hope that maybe people will look at eels in a different way and have a little bit of ownership and worry about what happens to the eel moving forward? 
Yes, I certainly hope that, and um, not only the eel. The eel is just one example of of a much bigger thing that is happening right now. The, uh, scientists uh, uh, calculate that the population of the European eel uh, uh, the, that I'm mostly writing about has gone down by more than 95% since the 70s. And that's a very drastic change. That is and, shocking. Uh, yeah, that is shocking. But but the eel is just one example of the many, many species that are threatened right now. And there, there's a lot of scientists that's actually talking about we are, that we are going into the sixth mass extinction, which means this is a, a period where a lot of species will disappear in a relatively short time. And you know, the last mass extinction was the fifth one, was uh, around 65 million years ago when all the dinosaurs uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. And this is, and now this is happening again. And, and f f for the first time in history, it's one species that, uh, that is a threat to every other species. And that's a, actually a remarkable thing and a very scary uh, thing happening. And Stephen, I want to ask you the same question. You know, how important is it, is it for us to know about these creatures so we do have a sense of ownership and we become involved, invested in what happens to them? Absolutely. Uh, getting the public and political will to to uh, protect our rivers, to protect our fish is key. Uh, I was part of a team that last week published a uh, Living Planet Index report on the state of freshwater migratory fish. And on a global basis, populations are, are down 73% uh, for fish that migrate in fresh water, including eel. So that's certainly, you know, we can talk about eel today, but we're really talking about all fish that undertake freshwater migrations. And there's many challenges they face. Uh, you know, dams are certainly a big one. When you're a migratory animal, you need to move up and downstream in rivers. And these animals have challenges that they face on the way to their freshwater feeding grounds. So when they're eels and uh, when they're elvers about yay long, uh, you know, about 15 to 30 centimeters long, they need to make their way upstream and they encounter large dams. So think about things like the Moses Saunders Dam uh, on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, fortunately, it's equipped with uh, an upstream eel ladder that allows those animals to move past but then uh, they also have to make their way back downstream. And at that point, they're long animals and they have to go through hydropower turbines. And so we know that uh, on the St. Lawrence, the cumulative mortality between the two main dams there on the way downstream is about 40%. And in fact, we think uh, based on some modeling work that fish, uh, that eel that move down through the Ottawa River may in fact experience 97% mortality from turbines. So hydropower is certainly a, a part of the problem, but they're working quite hard on solutions, trying to guide fish to safe paths using things like light. I mentioned that these animals are nocturnal, so if we can use light to guide them, to repel them essentially, we can push them into safe paths and use that to help them get, uh, stay away from the turbines and take safe, safe paths back to the ocean. Um, you mentioned a few threats to their habitats, but what is the biggest threat to the eel habitat, you, you would say? Yeah, in, in general, it's, it's habitat loss and dams are a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the, the native range of uh, American eel in the Great Lakes watershed, so thinking about Lake Ontario and the uh, St. Lawrence, Ottawa River and so on, uh, there are over 950 dams. And so, uh, yes, they're all the, you know, the big dams that I, I referenced before, but there's all sorts of small dams as well. Uh, and that limits access to up uh, to um, uh, feeding grounds that are up uh, upstream of those dams. And then there's fishing as well. There was historic commercial fishing uh, right through till uh, uh, the 2000s. Uh, there was uh, the Ontario uh, Endangered Species Act ended up uh, coming into force and uh, these and American eel were classified as endangered. And at that point, the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery uh, ceased. Uh, but there's a, there's a legacy uh, from that. These are long lived animals. So uh, when you push populations down, it really takes quite a long time for them to come back and then just layer on everything else, invasive species, climate change, uh, contaminants. These animals burrow in the substrate and that's where a lot of these contamin contaminants 
evidence uh, have accumulated over the years. So uh, basically any stressor you can think of that mm -hmm. freshwater fish have to deal with, American eel have to have has to deal with it um, throughout their their life. You know, we uh, we we called this segment. Uh, it's part of our vilified beasts uh, show for the week. Um, and Patrick, having written this incredible book that not only looks at history but also talks about your family's life, and I know that your father passed away. Um, our condolences. What do you think your dad would say about your book? That's um, been able to connect people, so many people, over something like the eel. I think he would be uh, excited. He, he was very interested in, in uh, nature and uh, animals and fishes, but he, he never, uh, he wasn't, he was a working man. He never really went to university, but he, he was interested in this. But I also think he would be very surprised that people uh, all over the world are actually reading a book that's uh, also about him, because uh, <laughs> I think he would find that very, very hard to believe. And Stephen, before we go, um, one question I didn't ask you that I meant to ask you is how long do eels live for? Right. So in the Great Lakes, uh, between 12 and 22 years or so is what's been documented in terms of their freshwater residency and then add in a couple more years for them to find their way to freshwater and find their way back. So uh, we think maximum for uh, American eels somewhere in the vicinity of 24 years. And Patrick, I'll let you have the last word. What do you think is the most important thing that people should know about eels that they probably don't know? Actually, you know about the, the, the age of the eel, the, the European eel. We have in Sweden documented an eel being over uh, 85 years old, and there are stories about eel being uh, eels being over 150 years old. So it can become very, very old. But uh, I think you, the important thing to understand that the eel is part of of the, uh, a much bigger natural system and all all species have a role in this system and whether you think the eel is uh, kind of scary or di disgusting it's uh, it's important to understand that every species is important uh, in, in in the whole nature natural system gentlemen thank you so much i've really enjoyed this conversation and i've learned a lot we appreciate your time and your insight Thank Thanks you so much. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, for our Vilified Bee series, we'll get the latest buzz about bugs. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.